Okay, we're going to talk about superconductor fractures like we did in the previous uh, session, only this is the second part. And because there's so much about superconductor fractures, we've had to, to make this into two sections. Today we're going to talk about the complications. And I hope that you, if you looked at and studied the first part and on how to do this, that you won't have the complications. But you maybe have to treat someone else's complications. So, what's the most dreaded complication? Probably compartment syndrome. That's right, Volkmann's ischemic contracture. And they're very, un, you know, that's, that's a long-term permanent disability that can occur if you've ever seen a child with this. Now, what's the most common lasting complication? Well, it's malunion. And it's a cubitus varus that occurs. And we're going to talk about both of these, how to prevent them, and what to do if they occur. Now, if you look, there are a lot of complications that occur with uh, superconductor fractures, some of which are, they're somewhat important, but they usually resolve. Now, so what is the order of frequency of complications? What's the most common one? A nerve injury. That's the right. Most common. And the nerve injuries, and then the vascular injuries, and a lot of the vascular injuries as we'll discuss, really are um, short-term and really resolve spontaneously. And then there's, of course, malunion and heterotopic bone formation, which is a very rare complication, and a vascular necrosis, which can occur. And we'll, we discussed that in more detail when we talked about fight cell injuries and a vascular necrosis of the trochlea. So, what, what's the overall incidence of nerve injuries? How often are you likely to see this? About 5%. Well, it's a little bit more. Originally, we said it was only 7% when we made the first edition of our fracture tent. This is what was the kind of the party line. This is what was said. But since then, we now know there are probably closer to 12%. Why do you think this changed? Uh, that was with the occlusion of the AIN involvement. That's exactly right. Is this was the average of seven most recently reported series. And you said, what is the most common nerve injury? The anterior interosseous nerve. The anterior interosseous nerve. Very good. It's really the median nerve, and it's the anterior interosseous branch. So, how is, the, how is it ma manifest? Flexion of the index finger. Beg pardon? Flexion of the index finger? Yeah, or yeah, flexion or the, actually yeah, of the thumb or the index finger. They have lack of flexion of the index finger. And a lot of times you have to look at that specifically. If you've got a child we're focusing on the swollen elbow, a lot of times it's hard to get them to do that. Uh, there was an article that was proposed that how you detect that, and, and what, if you ask the child if they have this, how they flex it, they will take their other hand and flex it down. But usually it's like this one. This girl, this boy, the mother said, how come he's always pointing at everybody? Because he'll flex the other fingers when he was in the cast, but wouldn't flex that finger. There's no sensory loss, and that's another reason why it's not appreciated. Okay, so the most common complication then associated with this is what? Um. Well, you don't recognize it. Failure to look for it and, and recognize it. And you have to look very specifically. And it probably occurs more commonly than we think because you have to, you have to really look for it. So, why, do, why is it very vulnerable? There's a fibrous band uh, under the pronator that That's is... That's exactly right. If you look at the pronator teres, there's a fibrous band there, and the median nerve goes under the pronator teres, but the anterior interosseous nerve goes right next to that fibrous band. And so it, if there's any dis posterior displacement of the distal fragment, it'll be pushed against that fibrous band and, and go out. Long term, it really is it's almost unheard of to have any long term effects. It almost always comes back. So this was originally described. That's why we're starting to see it more. It really wasn't described until about 1969 that we really started looking for it. So, what factor determines which 
nerve is most likely to be um, uh, involved? What factor? The type of displacement. That's right. Very good. The type of displacement. That's the distal displacement of the distal fragment. Okay, so now what you're going to tell me is what are the three major displacement patterns? We talked about them yesterday. Uh, posterior medial, posterior, posterior lateral. Posterior medial, posterior lateral, and? Flexion. Flexion. Very good. Flexion. Just form these. Very good. So let's go through each one of these. What nerve injury is most commonly seen with a posterior medial extension fracture pattern? So posterior medial will compress on the radial nerve. That's right. If you go back posterior medial, it's the radial nerve. And until we start looking for the anterior interosseous nerve, we said that the radial nerve was most commonly involved because the most common fracture pattern is posterior medial. It accounts for about 75%, only about a quarter are posterior lateral, fortunately. So, what's the treatment following a reduction of a fracture, following a reduction of a fracture, if the patient had a radial nerve deficit? Before the reduction? Yes. Uh -huh. Then you observe them. If That's right. By and large, most radial nerve deficits can be observed if the deficit was present when it first came. What's the usual time that you can figure that it's going to take before you get motion back? Approximately three months. Oh. Five, five months. months, that's right. Five months is about the average time. If it goes longer than that, then there may be some other things that you missed. So, but there may be times that you may, so usually you wait, by and large, because most of the time they'll come back. Okay, so if it's an open fracture, irreducible fracture with a nerve deficit, or the nerve function disappears after the reduction maneuver, you're concerned that maybe it's stuck in the fracture. Or if the nerve loss is present, both complete motor and sensory, you may want to look at it. And then serious consideration should be given for surgery exploring the nerve. But it's pretty rare that you need to do this. Almost all of them are curved. You see it as an open fracture or when you have an irreducible fracture with or without a nerve deficit. So, um, and then because if, if they have both complete motor and sensory missing, the nerve may be lacerated. So, what's most common nerve after a posterior lateral? The median nerve. That's right, the median nerve. That's right, and we talked about this just in the last session. If there's complete motor sensory of the median nerve, what other complication can be masked? Uh, vascular injury. Well, yes, but what other? Even more than that, vascular injury, but what is the sequela? Oh, you worry about a compartment syndrome. That's right. And why, do you, why is it worried? Uh, because you lose sensation to the That's right. You have, the big key is, as we'll talk when we get into to compartment syndromes, the big key that tells you you have a compartment syndrome is pain. Yeah, the pain and lack of motor function. And if you have a complete median nerve out, you'll have both, the, you won't have pain because they don't feel anything and you can't detect the uh, motor function. So this is maybe one, if you have, this is one that maybe you need to do in the middle of the night. So a compartment syndrome, because the lack of sensation in the form compartment may mask the pain of a developing compartment syndrome. Okay, what nerve injury is most common with the flexion pattern? That's the ulnar nerve. That's the ulnar nerve, that's right. And we talked about this in the previous session. So if you have an ulnar nerve, it may be more of a flexion type of injury, as you can see here. So what other conditions contribute to the development of an ulnar nerve deficit associated with a supraconal fragment? Uh, a delayed um, varus malunion. That's one. What else? You may have caused it. Oh, an iatrogenic? Yeah. What is that? Uh, from a pin placement. Yeah, a putting a pin, pin through the medial side. That's right. So acutely, it's a medial placed percutaneous pin. Chronically, 
a residual varus cubitus varus deformity because then the nerve has a tendency to um, <clears throat> uh, flip, go anteriorly, go across the medial epicondyle and get uh, chronically injured. So here's a patient that comes in with a median nerve, you know, ulnar nerve di disposition. You put a, a percutaneous pin, and this is the, what, what, what's going on here? How can you tell this patient has an ulnar nerve deficit? You can see atrophy between his uh, yeah, lawyers and osseous. Yeah, interosseous atrophy, which is supplied by the ulnar nerve. So you, you decided to put a medial pin in, and when the patient wakes up, they have an ulnar nerve deficit. What are you going to do? Uh, personally, I'd probably take the pin out. You are? Okay. Well, it's not a totally benign complication, saying the recovery rate is not 100%. So this is what's been recommended. Do nothing and simply leave the pin in. Some people say that's all you need to do. Wait till the fracture heals that they will go ahead. But in my experience, I've seen some significant complications from ulnar nerve. I had one child that was real small and had the medial pin and the child didn't have any sensation in the little finger and he chewed off the tip of his little finger. Um, in place until the fracture is healed. Or you remove the offending pin and alter the pin structure by inserting more pins laterally. Or some people say remove the pin and immediately explore the nerve. Which would you do? I think I'd lean towards the second. Yes, option. right, towards the second. That's probably the best thing. That, in the few instances where I've had that occur, that's usually what I do. And usually by the time they come out of the cast, we already see some recurrence. Okay, now we look at vascular injuries. There's two major categories of vascular injuries. What are they? One would be well, there's direct and there's indirect. So what's the instance of direct injuries? That means there's a direct injury to the vein or artery itself. Is that well, it averages 5%? around 5%. It actually probably is even a little bit more, but it may not be clinically significant or have clinical effects or clinically apparent. But some people have done some studies, some high-tech vascular studies, like uh, vascular arteri uh, MRIs, and found that actually there's a pretty high incidence of direct injuries, but they're not clinically manifest, um, and they don't seem to result in any long-term effects. What about the indirect injuries? Well, that's fortunately now everybody's so worried about it. We, in most places, it only occurs where the, they don't get good primary care. And now we as orthopedic surgeons are so um, worried about it that we really look for it, and it's pretty rare. Uh, I hate to say this, but I haven't seen a a uh, compartment syndrome in the forearm in 40 years in our facility. Um, so what fracture pattern has the highest incidence of vascular injuries? Posterior lateral. That's right. It's the posterior lateral, as we discussed here, because that distal portion of the proximal fragment is tinting the uh, brachial artery if it's displaced. Now, what are the two major direct vascular injuries? Well, you can have brachial artery obstruction internally, or it can be complete brachial artery rupture. Now, what about regular artery obstruction? What are the three major causes of obstruction? So there's a, a vascular spasm. That's right. Well, you can have direct impingement, and you can have arteriomuscular spasm. And what's the third one? internally. Uh, is that a, uh, if you have a block or a yeah, thrombus? Yeah, right. Internal obstruction, which can be a, a clot or some type of uh, animal tear. So let's look at brachial artery obstruction. Suppose the patient has impingement at the fracture site, like in this one. What's the first thing that you need to do? In Reduce all vascular injuries, what's the first thing you need to do? Reduce the fracture. Yeah. What would you do? Uh, uh, reduce it and then redo the vascular exam. That's right. If they reduce it, you reduce it, 
And a lot of times, once you reduce it, the vascular, the impingement is gone and the vascular um, integrity resumes. So the first step in all vascular injuries is that you perform a reduction in stabilization of the fracture, then reassess it. And that's why it's important to do it very early. Now, what are the methods of remedying arterial spasm? This is really more for the vascular surgeons. Well, you can do a sympathetic nerve block, and you can do adventitial stripping and perpaverin uh, application. And unfortunately, sympathetic nerve blocks is something that's kind of lost uh, to do that. How do you do a sympathetic? Where, what are you looking for? Where do you block the upper extremity sympathetic nerve? Probably the dorsal root ganglion. Or the that's right. It's, how is this accomplished? Well, we might, since then, we don't really do it very much anymore. It might be valuable to review the technique of an upper extremity sympathetic block. And you're looking for the stellate ganglion. Where is that? What's the anatomical location that you look for? Well, it's usually their anterior, that's the stellate ganglion. And the bony landmark is, there's usually a prominence of the uh, lateral process here of the six cervical vertebrae. And usually you go in to find that, and once you find that, here you can see find this anterior tubercle, then that's where you stick your needle. You usually have the patient asleep when you do this. But I've had that, I've done that a couple times, and it really makes a difference. They really pink up after that. It really relieves really a lot of the spasm. So this is something you need to have in your armamentarium. I hate to say this, but a lot of times you ask the anesthesiologist to do it, and they don't know how to do it. They don't do this very often. So you inject it at the palpable anterior C6 tubercle, and usually that's close enough to the stellate ganglion to give you a sympathetic block. And so usually with that, you go from a white hand to a pink hand. So, what's the most common types of internal obstruction? Well, there's thrombosis, and there's an animal tear. So, how are you going to treat the thrombosis? Or how do you think the vascular surgeon is going to treat the thrombosis? I think there's some new, they can thread a catheter and release. Yeah, you can do a thrombectomy as one way. Or, this was popular a number of years ago. They would catheterize up to the artery and then they put a thrombolytic agent, urokinase or streptokinase, and essentially dissolve the, the um, uh, thrombus. What about animal tears? I think the problem with the animal tears is that uh, they have to actually cut that segment out. That's right, that's right. You have to do a resection. This requires resection and repair. Okay, so if this phase of established no, what's the next step? Well. You have to have your vascular surgeon because you have to consider surgical section and repair with a vein graft. Now, this is a patient I had years ago, and he was bleeding like this. It's interesting. He had full flexion extension, no pain in his forearm. He was a little upset about, and his mother was a little upset about this injury here, but he had no signs of compartment syndrome. And uh, years ago, if you look at some of the original fracture texts, they were in the 30s and 40s, they recommended um, just tying off the artery. And by tying off the artery, you would create a sympathetic block. Should we repair this, or should we tie, just tie it off? Well, today in our society, we have the facilities to do that, and so I called in the vascular surgeon, and he came and fixed it. He was able to repair it primarily. So he did a primary repair. So what is the major indirect vascular complication? Is that the Volkmann's ischemic yeah, contracture? Yeah, it's right. It's a compartment syndrome, which will lead to Volkmann's contracture. That's right. So it, it, what you want to do is prevent the development of Volkmann's by treating the compartment syndrome. So what causes that? Uh, when you have swelling in the soft tissues, which... Yeah, but why? 
uh, usually from the fracture site, bleeding. Well, well, what else? What, what, what is the major factor that causes the muscles to become dysfunctional and their sodium pumps become dysfunctional and so fluid goes into the muscles and doesn't come out. Is that the reperfusion? Beg pardon? Is that the reperfusion of the components? Yeah, right. Increased pressure because of alteration of the sodium pump and the cells caused by prolonged ischemia. Anytime you have prolonged ischemia of the muscles and direct injury to the muscles. Uh, we used to see this when kids would get their arm in uh, ringers in the old washing machines and there would be direct injury to the muscles or if they have a crush or a car runs over their arm or something like that. But most commonly it's prolonged ischemia. That's why it's important if you have an alteration in dysvascularity, it's the longer you wait to treat it, the more chance you're going to have of a compartment syndrome. Now, well, how do you know the patient's developing a compartment syndrome? I what are the two criteria that, t that leads you to the fact that he's having a compartment, he or she's having a compartment syndrome? Usually it's an increased demand in pain medication. That's right. Well, there's an, how about an ad, just an absence of radio pulse? That's not always indicative of That's that. right. Very good. It's not necessarily so. The signs of muscle ischemia are the presence of a radial pulse doesn't also rule out the presence of a compartment syndrome because you can have um, a radial pulse with a compartment syndrome. So one of the best ways to check for a compartment syndrome is to put a pulse oximeter on. Is that correct? I think that's proven to be false. Yes, that's right. What does that measure? That's just going to measure the O2, the skin, and that's it doesn't right. measure that's right. the muscle. That's right. All, all it does, it doesn't adequately assure against the compartment is not present. If you have trouble, you're really in trouble. The patient's really in trouble and may even result in amputation if you have really drop in this. So usually the skin uh, uh, oxygenation is pretty good. So really all it does is it measures only the skin oxygenation. And what oxygenation do you really, are you concerned about? The muscles. Uh, the muscles, that's right. It doesn't tell you muscle blood flow. So you want to check the muscle blood flow. What are the best, what are the symptoms that you have adequacy of your muscle flow or inadequacy of your muscle flow? What's the first thing? Well, they're going to hurt. It's going to be painful. So if you're going to evaluate this, how do you evaluate? Use all this technology, or is it functional evaluation? It's midnight. You just reduce this forearm. Beforehand, the patient wasn't moving his fingers, and you had, as we'll see some of the other things, dysvascularity. Um, what are you going to do? You're going to do anything functional, you're going to send for an MRI, or you're going to do a functional exam. I think I do functional exam. That's right. That's probably the most important thing is the most accurate thing. Because I've seen instances where people have done compartment pressures and they were supposedly normal, yet they had, a, they had all the other signs of a um, uh, compartment syndrome and they relied only on this technical thing which involves, one, the absence of pain in the muscles, or two, the quality of the forearm muscle function. Now, are they moving their hand? You know, what's the quality of the muscle function? So, which muscles are most likely to have the early signs of dysfunction? Uh, those would be the deep muscles. That's right. Yeah, it's usually the deep forearm compartment muscles, the flexor digitorum profundus, the flexure pollus as long as those are the ones that are going to be most involved. So if a patient has a clinical findings of a compartment syndrome, what do you do? Everybody if, agrees. If you have clinical signs of a compartment syndrome, what's the first thing that you do? Uh, you do a fasciotomy. Well, yeah, no, that's, that's not right. The first thing. That's right. Every moment measure compartment pressure, well, it may be useful, but if it's low, I mean, they have the clinical signs, it may not be all that useful because 
There's a little bit of problem sometimes in measuring compartment pressures. It's not always all that accurate. Or you initiate the treatment for compartment syndrome, which is? The fasciotomy. That's right. Yeah, and the effective, only effective treatment for compartment syndrome is a fasciotomy of the volar compartment muscles through a Henry approach. And everybody pretty much releasing both the deep and superficial compartments at a minimum. Usually you don't have to do anything to the extensor compartments. So, what's the best treatment for a patient with symptoms or signs of vascular compromise? One, they have an absent radial pulse. Number two, they've got a cool and pale hand. And number three, they've got signs of muscle ischemia. What are you gonna do? Since you just reduced it, um, the concern is that that may be causing the obstruction, so you'd want to take them to the OR for that. Yeah, you've, you've already reduced it, and they, you know, they're on the floor, and they're waking up, and now you have all of these signs. What are you going to do? Go back to the OR. Yeah. For some forearm pain, absent muscle activity, everyone would think and agree that you treat this as a compartment syndrome with a fasciotomy. So here's the other problem. You have this patient, and they have an absent pulse, radio pulse, but they've got a nice warm pink hand, and they have no signs of muscle ischemia. But they don't have a pulse. What are you gonna do? I think a warm and pink perfused hand you can observe. That's right, that's right. And there's muscle activities present. And here there's some varying op options, opinions. Some people are very aggressive if there's an absent radial pulse, and they'll evaluate for vascular injury and repair the lesion if it's found um, in this group here. Other people have found that many is that the pulse will return in time, and if there's evidence of adequate perfusion of the muscles, in other words, lack of pain and the muscles are functioning, they can be carefully observed and you probably need them in leave them in the hospital for 24 to 48 hours is what you do. And so this group here is what I do. And this is what I personally will do in, in my experience. So what's the bottom line? Well, you treat each case separately as your experience or expertise dictates. The final decision may depend on the advice of your vascular consultant. And so it's always good to get a vascular surgeon in and get them on board. Most important points to remember, the presence of a pulse alone does not rule out the absence of a compartment syndrome. The presence of a normal compartment pressure alone does not rule out the presence of a compartment syndrome. Uh, <clears throat> the absence of a pulse does not automatically mean that the patient has or will develop a compartment syndrome and the other thing is they've done with some long-term studies, primary brachialidal repair may not assure long-lasting arterial patency. This group out here out of Vancouver looked at their patients down, about a year down the road and had, had brachialidal repair and found there was a large number of them that had reobstructed, but they had enough collateral circulation to function. So. An anteriogram does not need to be performed because you know where the, the pathology is. It's at the fracture site. So you don't need to waste time doing an arteriogram. This is a group out of, out of Boston Children's. And the other question is, if you don't have a brachial artery, are you going to get uh, claudication, significant late claudication? And there really isn't much documented injury. Uh, published like this. This was a, a concern. Uh, there is some concern and evidence that it occurs in adults, but in children it doesn't seem to. And so there's, there's been some studies where they've had the uh, brachial artery was completely obstructed, but they didn't develop late claudication. And that was one of the arguments that some people will do for saying that you need to repair everyone. And of course, if you repair everyone, there's still a high instance that they'll cloud off. Now, we'll go to the angular deformities. In general, what patterns of the malleon can be grouped? The varus? Well, angulation, oh, angulation. And translocation are the two major displacement patterns that you have to deal with. Or rotation, and which one has the potential to remodel? 
The translocation. That's right. Here's a good example. Here's a patient who has 100% translocation in the San Angelo Plain, was treated at another outlying hospital, and actually 50% in the coronal plain. But the angulation is pretty good. There's not any varus deformity. And actually, there is a little loss of the shaft counter angle here. So the translocation, what would you expect? Well, a year post injury, you can see that actually the, there was no angulation, but the translocation that you had here has completely remodeled and completely remodeled. But you still have a little problem because the angulation has not remodeled. So the translocation usually remodeled. There was still some loss of flexion. And this was given to me by one of my colleagues, Dr. Colin Mosley of, of Canada. So does angulation remodel? No. No. Here's a good example. Here's a seven-year-old injury films, type three, posterior medial, neurovascular was intact. Well, what did they do here? I, they lost fixation. Well, they probably never had it in the first place. This is a good example of in which pins were placed in the form, but they failed to do one thing. What was that? Capture the fragment. Reduce the fragment. Perfect. Reduce it. And then capture it. That's right. So what's it going to turn out? Okay. This is that. These in various. So to summarize, angulation with time remains as angulation that's right whereas the rules of distal humor remodeling and translocation usually remodels angulation doesn't as we talked about in our previous session in the sagittal plane you can get if you got enough time and they're still growing you may get as much as 20 degrees of angulation so how is angulation in the coronal plane manifest clinically uh, it'll be loss, if it's an extension type injury, it'll be loss of flexion. Well, you have loss of flexion, but how is the clinical manifestation? Uh, it, if they have what, a what is it that bothers the, the parents? The, the appearance of it, yeah, they may have a that's worsening. Right. These cucumbers. parents were a little upset about this because doctor, he had the potential to be good in sports. And he could probably throw a pretty good curveball even with that. But this is a really bad uh, deformity. And so, the loss of angulation in the sagittal plane, how does it manifest, Clayton? You just mentioned that. Uh, they, they wouldn't be able to flex That's right. up they'll, all the way. They usually have hyperextension, which just makes the, the deformity look worse. And <clears throat> they'll lose elbow flexion. Here's one. Had the normal side had full flexion. This one had affected side, but had less flexion. Usually, it's not of any clinical or functional significance unless it's extreme. And here's a good example where it was extreme. This was a six-year-old female, fell from a swing, was treated at another facility. This is the fracture pattern. And notice that, actually, that's not too bad. The anterior humor line does go through there. And so this is an extension posterior lateral fracture. She underwent a closed reduction, but was she really reduced? No, in fact, Where's the anterior? She was actually worse after they put the pins in. Now, your assessment here, one, <clears throat> the, the, the cross pins, distal fragment is still extended. And how's she going to affect her functionally? Well, here she is when she's healed. And notice that the anterior, there is absolutely no shaft counter angle. So she's going to lose about <clears throat> 40 degrees of flexion. And so, here you see the distal fragment is still extended, and there's no carrying angle. So, here's she going to, how how's she going to, this is a normal extension, but this is the maximum flexion. So, she, she had some disability with this, because she couldn't get that hand to her head uh, for taking care of her hair and knees and brushing her teeth and so forth. When you compare it with the other side, you can see how much flexion she got here. So, the message is, Sagittal plane is important as well, and it, and it may have, uh, give you a cosmetic effect. This patient had only slight varus, but this, and which is manifest by a small crescent sign, as we saw this patient before, but the lack of extension just 
made the virus more cosmetically unappealing. So rotation, how does it appear, uh, affect the appearance or function? I don't think rotation affects yeah, it Yeah, it really much. doesn't. And here's a good example that it's rotated almost 90 degrees, but the shaft counter angle is still maintained. And here again, as long as the angulation is controlled, the rotation, there's enough extra in your shoulder that usually it doesn't cause any problem. And here it was pinned in this position, but you can indicate you have rotational malalignment because you have different diameters. But if you look closely, the carrying angle has been maintained and the shaft counter angle is. Uh, but the pins, the reason it had rotation is because the pins were not divergent and they are all right at the fracture site. So, this patient comes in, he's now 10 years old. Suppose he sent to you two weeks post injury, what are you going to do? Uh, at two weeks, you wouldn't want to touch it. That's right. What would you recommend? Open re-reduction? Leave alone? Mm -hmm. You might send to one of your enemies. Your <laughs> <laughs> so it's best, you're right, it's best to wait until the fracture is fully recovered if he comes in at two weeks. I usually say anything more than a week is probably best. So now he comes back in one year post-injury, and what are the alternatives? Will this remodel? No. Will remodel with time? It's been a year. So it can be only corrected with an osteotomy. But before you do an osteotomy, though, what, when should the deformities be corrected? You need to wait until the elbow has recovered the maximum motion that's possible with the resultant deformity. So they may not, this patient here may not have full flexion, but they'll get the maximum motion with that deformity. And you wait until they've gotten that, and that's when you want to go ahead and do your osteotomy, which is usually about a year down the road. And before we take an osteotomy, you really have to have an understanding of the pathology. So what are the components of this bony deformity? Uh, there's an angulation component. That's right. It's a, it is a true structural deformity. Here's an anatomical specimen, and it's true structure. So, in some rare instances, you may just have a unipolar deformity in the coronal plane, and this is what we talked about in the previous section, that sometimes you'll have nothing more than just medial greens to collapse. But you re deformity is usually triplanar, and so what are the three rotational components? So the extent, you mean the extension? Component? Well, they have horizontal rotation, they have sagittal and extension, and they usually have coronal angulation. And usually it's a combination of all three is the deformity that you have. All three are combined. And so here you have sagittal angulation, horizontal, you can't see it here, and you have coronal angulation. And of course you can see there's a mark on this patient, there's a mark semi-lunar or uh, half moon sign here indicating severe varus. So what do you need to correct? You need to correct all these? No. What's I the one that's bothering the patient the most or the parent? It, the angulation, I that's think. That's right, the varus. So really you want to try to get by with just the varus component. And it's been shown that the more complex you make your osteotomy, the higher risk you have of complications. And here's, there have been reports of different osteotomies in which they try to correct all three deformities. Here they corrected the coronal plane angulation, and here they corrected the sagittal plane angulation, and they did the horizontal angulation. And if you try to do all three, it's very difficult to do, and you don't have good fixation. So you really ought to focus on the uh, varus angulation. Now, you really need to understand, though, you're going to tell the parents, if you correction of deformity, what's the complication rate? I think it can be as high as 50%. Well, it used to be 50% before we really had better sophisticated surgical procedures. Fortunately, down it's about 15%. So, what are the types? Well, probably the most popular is a single plane lateral closing wedge. What's important here? Probably well, the... Well, what's important in performing this osteotomy? Uh, 
That you don't disrupt the medial cortex? Yeah, you need to have, the limbs must be equal when you have the osteotomy. But the big problem is, it's really hard to get very distal, and you, it's very hard to get to put the pins without crossing at the pin site. And here it's very, you see it's very difficult. You want to have the pins separated, but you can see it's, it's really difficult to get as far distal as you can. And as we'll see, actually, when you do the wedge, you still have some lateral translocation, and you still have a lot of lateral prominence associated with this. So this is difficult to get it distal enough, and it's difficult to get wide pin separation for stability. So the other problem is here, this one had a closing wedge, a little bit more distal, but notice that there is a lateral prominence. There's usually a lateral translocation with this and lateral overgrowth of the condyle. And so when you do a, a varus osteotomy, about, you know, putting it into some valgus, you'll make that prominence more learned. So there have been other modifications to decrease this lateral prominence. Some people will do a dome osteotomy, which is really a lateral closing wedge with medial rotation. Uh, I found this is very difficult because the medial and lateral intermuscular septum sometimes make it difficult to rotate this. And really what it is, it's really a, a wedge osteotomy, but it's in rotation. And here's one that we did. And fortunately, you still see the lateral column, but fortunately, this patient, when we did it, that periosteum was out like this and went ahead and went ahead and got a good uh, appearance and remodeled with some time. Here's another modification in which you do a step cut, and when you do that, you can get by supposedly with just a single screw, but I don't trust that, and we've always used uh, cross pins to supplement with a single screw. Or if you make a, a lateral closing wedge, but you make it oblique, like if you move the apex of the wedge distal, and this will decrease the instance of lateral one, decrease the degree of lateral prominence. So what are the surgical approaches? Well, if it's a simple lateral wedge, you can do a straight lateral approach. If it is a deep step to dome or steep, steep step cut, you need to see that posterior aspect, so you have to use a posterior triceps splitting approach or a Bernie Mori approach. Now, what type of fixation? Well, crossword fixation is probably the most popular, but you need to avoid crossing at the osteotomy site. You need to get as much thing. And this may be difficult when you're doing a simple lateral closing wedge. And there should be some separation at the osteotomy site. What's the clinical outcome? Well, when you take your x-rays, your preoperative findings, always have them kind of frown because they're very unhappy. <laughs> And this was an ugly prominence for this girl. And here you can see she was not very happy. But when they, after the surgery, you have them smile to make sure <laughs> that they're happy. And now I see she's happy because she's lost that prominence and now has a good um, evaluation. I find there's a reverse, uh, Korean reverse V osteotomy, and I think is probably the most uh, has the best uh, track record. And essentially what you do is that you measure the amount of varus that you have. And this patient had 25 degrees of cubitus varus. So that's the wedge that you take out. And that corrects the angulation, but you still have some lateral b uh, bump. And you correct that by translocating this A up to C and putting it up in here, and that gets rid of it. And that gives you some intrinsic stability as well, as you can see here. So now the carrying angle is 15 degrees. And if you note this, this corrects both the angulation that we did with taking out that wedge, and then by translocating it, it decreases the lateral prominence in the lateral prominence. So here's a young girl. She, her arm is crooked. She didn't like it. You can see she didn't like it. 
She was an adolescent. And here she had full remotion, full extension. Does she need an operation? No. No? Well, she's not very happy about it. So we did do it. And we'll say it's not totally a cosmetic procedure. So what we did is you do a first transverse osteotomy at 90 degrees. And then you, re this is the resection of the angle that she had. And it's equal to the amount of various angulation. And you take that out, and then you take this, that lateral portion here that was down here, and you put it up in that apex. And she was big enough that we fixed her like you did a T Connor. And here you can see that's up like this, and rotated into valgus. And the ul this is the ulnar nerve. This was a um, Mori, Brian Mori approach to see the whole distal like you do for a T. Connor fracture in the posterior plate. And then you can take that little wedge that you took out and put it as a kind of a bone graft in there. And <clears throat> so now she's straight, but she's a little concerned because it's a big scar. So unfortunately, not all the cases have a satisfactory result. And that can be a real problem. This one had the varus, was initially corrected, but for some reason, it didn't hold. So now, what's the patient have? A non-union. Well, they have. They're going to heal, but the patient has still a cubitus varus and a scar. Yeah. So they're not very happy with that. And I had one I saw was treated elsewhere. They injured the radial nerve, so they had cubitus varus, a scar, and a radial nerve injury. So you you have to tell the parents that this operation does have some complications and that they really need to make sure that the main reason that they're going to want to have it done is cosmetic. Now, the greatest causes of unsatisfactory results are either adequate, inadequate correction or fixation. Now, some say it's only a cosmetic deformity. I had one patient that was turned down because their insurance didn't cover cosmetic surgery and they said this was all cosmetic. Can you say that's true? I think are there's there, a delayed... There's are a there any functional consequences? I think they have an increased risk of a lateral condyle That's fracture. right. Very good. Anytime you have a cubitus varus, reported functional consequences are they do get recurrent lateral condyle fractures. And here you can see this patient has lateral condyle fracture that's done. It. So they're much more predisposed to this. They can get a tardy ulnar nerve paralysis. Sometimes they'll get some posterior lateral instability or recurrent dislocation of the radial head. I'm not sure how this, I've never seen this occur, but uh, some people said that it may predispose to posterior shoulder instability. Uh, but I think the main reason for you doing it, and this is where I've seen this, is the recurrent lateral condyle fracture. Okay. Now, what do you be suspicious of this scenario? This patient had an open reduction, I mean a closed reduction, and had regained some early elbow motion following pin removal at three weeks. But then for the last two months, this elbow motion has remained fixed at 30 to 90 degrees. Uh, I think you'd be worried about a myositis ossificans. <coughs> That's right. It's really not myositis ossificans. It's really heterotopic ossification. And here you can see it can be mild, or in some cases it actually can be very severe. So what factors can contribute to heterotopic ossification? Uh, a, a repeat reduction after... Um, That's right. Vigorous or repeated elbow manipulation during the reduction process, or post-reduction aggressive physical therapy, and I've seen that occur. The kids are a little bit slow in getting their motion back, and so the therapist really pushes on them and does a lot of aggressive physical therapy and they will sometimes then get that or a delayed open reduction. So sometimes we don't even know why they develop it. So what's the unusual treatment for this complication? Usually you can observe it. That's right. You observe it as the ossification mass usually disappears spontaneously. So and thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions?